Today, we are heading to Isiolo, Kenya. Located four hours northeast of the capital, Nairobi, the small but vibrant town is a place of contrast where modern life mingles with ancient traditions. It was here that in July 2005, a beloved shepherd of the Catholic Church met a tragic and untimely end. The mother of Bishop Luigi Locati, the leader of the Isiolo Diocese, sent shockwaves through the community and the nation at large. This is the story of how a man of God, dedicated to serving the people of Kenya, fell victim to a sinister plot orchestrated by those he trusted the most. It's a tale of power, corruption, and the devastating consequences of greed. Welcome or welcome back to The Crime Gist. My name is Damisa. Born on July 23, 1928, in a small town in Vinzalio, Italy, Luigi Locati felt the calling to the priesthood from a young age. In 1952, at the age of 24, he was ordained as a Catholic priest. He was thrilled as he had a very deep desire to spread the word of God. For the next decade, Locati's path would lead him to distant lands as he answered the church's call to minister to the faithful. In 1963, the same year that Kenya gained independence from colonial rule, the young priest, who was by then 35 years old, was sent to the East African nation. This was to a town known as Isiolo, where he was supposed to oversee the establishment of Isiolo Diocese. Isiolo has a population of around 80,000 people. It's a mix of Somali, Borana, and the Ameru communities. The Somali residents who first settled in the area as soldiers after the World War I are mostly business people who engage in livestock farming. Additionally, Isiolo has some Indians who are mostly businessmen. The town is religiously diverse with a near equal Christian and Muslim population. The Jamia Mosque is the largest of all and also a remarkable landmark in Isiolo. Luigi Locati quickly fell in love with Isiolo. He immersed himself in the local culture, learning the native languages and becoming a beloved figure in the community. Over the next 40 years, the Italy-born bishop dedicated his life to serving the people of Isiolo. He felt he had settled and found a new home and there were no plans of ever leaving. Under Locati's leadership, Isiolo Diocese flourished. Locati established schools, clinics, and even a radio station to serve his flock. The bishop's unwavering commitment to help people earned him the respect and admiration of all those who knew him. Over the years, Isiolo itself was also changing, becoming a thriving hub of activity. But even as it did, Bishop Locati remained a constant beacon of hope and faith for all who sought his guidance. Sadly, this was all about to come to an end. On the evening of July 14, 2005, Bishop Locati's life was about to be cut tragically short. That evening, between 6.45 p.m. and 7 p.m., the then 77-year-old was walking home from the Isiolo Pastoral Center where he had just finished a meal. Just meters from his home, a group of armed men emerged from the shadows and opened fire. Before he knew it, Locati was hit in the right shoulder by a bullet that came from a deadly G3 rifle. The bullet went in through the shoulder to the neck and then to the jaw, shattering his jawbone and tearing through major blood vessels. The elderly bishop collapsed, mortally wounded, and died about an hour later at a nearby hospital. The murder of Bishop Locati came as a shock to the community of Isiolo. Hundreds, including the then president of Kenya, Mwai Kibaki, mourned the loss of this beloved man of God. The president promised that he would make sure that the authorities get to the bottom of it and uncover the bishop's killer. With that, the investigators quickly went to work, trying to piece up the pieces of who would have wanted the priest dead. They initially suspected that the murder might have been arranged by a political enemy of Bishop Locati, since the bishop had been very outspoken in denouncing official corruption and black market profiteering. However, as they got closer to unraveling the mystery, they realized that the murder of Bishop Locati was not the work of political enemies as they had initially suspected. Instead, the focus of the investigation soon shifted to two other men of God. 
the very priest serving under Bishop Locati in the Isiolo Diocese. These were Father Guyo Marley Wako and Father Cyril Mukuchia. The suspects were quickly arrested and brought in for questioning. Church leaders were stunned by the arrests but promised to support the officials in their investigations. Father Guyo Marley had recently been forced out of a parish assignment because of complaints that he had been squandering funds. Father Cyril Mukuchia, on the other hand, had been involved in a dispute over the mismanagement of two schools that were eventually closed down on Bishop Locati's orders. Arrested alongside the two priests were a group of five men, Muhammad Bagajo, Aiden Muhammad, Mahati Halake, Roba Bariche, and Dika Wario. Dika Wario was said to be the owner of the murder weapon, which was established to be a G3 rifle. Upon further investigations, one of the priests, Father Cyril Mukuchia, was discharged. The evidence supported that he had nothing to do with the murder. They were now left with Father Guyo Marley as the main suspect and the five guys that supposedly helped him with this. Subsequent investigations would reveal a chilling plot orchestrated by Father Guyo. You might be wondering what would have led this man of God down this path. What was the motive? Well, prosecutors claimed that the motive for the murder was a power struggle over the control of church funds which were under Bishop Locati's control. There were reported disagreements between Father Guyo and Bishop Locati, with the bishop reportedly instructing Father Guyo to stop soliciting for donor funds. This had angered Father Guyo because these funds had been a significant source of income for him. The bishop's effort to curb Father Guyo's misuse of church funds had apparently pushed the priest into a state of frustration. Prosecutors alleged that this, combined with greed and a thirst for power, led him to recruit a group of accomplices to carry out the brutal assassination of Bishop Locati. The court was told of how the murder was carried out. All in a twisted power struggle over the control of the funds, Father Guyo had planned, financed, and recruited the other men to carry out the killing. He had also facilitated the acquisition of the firearm used in the attack. Evidence also showed that he had transported the killers to the scene of the crime. Father Guyo was found to have also withdrawn a large amount of money from his bank account on the day of the murder. He meant to use this money to pay off the killers. Roba Bala Bariche, the other suspect, was found to have been directly involved in the bishop's murder as he was the link between Father Guyo and the others in planning and executing the mission. There was a lot of communication between Father Guyo and Roba Bala Bariche. Mohamed Bagajo was found to have taken part in the meetings held to plan the attack and was also present at the scene of the crime. Diko Wario was the owner of the gun that had been used in this murder. Aiden Mohamed, the other suspect, was also recruited to kill Bishop Lokati. He was used by the group to hire the G3 rifle, which he then delivered to Father Guyo. Aiden was also at the scene of the crime. Mahati Halake is the other guy who took part in the planning and acquisition of the gun. The most damning evidence came from someone who said that Father Guyo Wako had previously planned to kill the bishop, but the plan had failed. This witness claimed that Father Guyo had promised him a reward of 10,000 shillings, but he got scared and pulled out of the plan the last minute. The court was shocked to learn that this was not the first attempt on the bishop's life. There was a lot of evidence against the men, including confessions, recorded interrogations, and testimonies from 37 prosecution witnesses. On the 4th of November 2014, after an eight-year trial, the High Court judge Fred Ochieng found Father Guyo Wako and four other men guilty of the murder of Bishop Luigi Locati. One of the accused men, Dika Wario, was ultimately acquitted. The judge acknowledged that evidence showed that he had been tricked into providing his gun, believing that it would be used for hunting ostriches. The other five, Father Guyo Male Wako, Mohamed Bagajo, Aiden Mohamed, Mahati Halake, and Roba Bariche, were all sentenced to death. The most appropriate sentence in this case 
and which I hereby hand down is that each and every one of the five accused persons is hereby sentenced to suffer death as by law prescribed. Upon hearing that her son had been found guilty and sentenced to death, the mother of Father Guyo Male collapsed and died. This would sound like the end of the story, but there was more to come. Three years after this sentencing, in 2017, there was a significant change in the Kenyan law that would greatly affect our case here. The Supreme Court, in a different case, had pronounced that death sentences were unconstitutional. The following year, 2018, Father Guyo, Male, and the other four convicts were back in court. They had made an application to the court seeking a resentencing in light of the Supreme Court decision regarding death sentences. In conformity with this decision, all the death sentences previously handed to convicts were commuted to life imprisonment. However, during a resentencing hearing, the law allows the judges the discretion to hear the parties again, receive fresh evidence, and give a different sentence other than having the death sentence automatically commuted to a life sentence. Father Guyo Male and his guys saw this as a chance to plead their case in the hopes of a reduced sentence. They brought whatever evidence they could to help their case, arguing that they had been rehabilitated and deserved a second chance. Father Guyo, who was the brains behind the murder, said that he was very remorseful, adding that he had been rehabilitated and continued to preach in prison. He asked to be given a second chance, even producing letters he had written to the victim's family, asking for forgiveness and seeking reconciliation. He also had recommendations from the staff at Committee Prisons Academy, who said that he had been well behaved behind bars since 2005 when he was first arrested and arraigned. The other four had almost similar pleas, saying that they had been rehabilitated while in prison. Some of them had families and they asked for leniency based on this fact. They also claimed that they had become very spiritual while in prison. They asked the court to consider the time they had already spent in jail in coming up with a sentence for them. They had all already been in prison for about 15 years at this point. After this mitigation, their fate was now left in the hands of the court. They were all praying for anything but a life sentence. Even though they had senselessly ended someone's life, they wanted to hold on to the hope that one day they would be free. In July 2021, they were all in court again, but this time for the major decision. A lot of things had, however, come to light during this resentencing period. There was some information that came to light that had previously been overlooked. For example, the ages of the offenders when they first committed the crime and were arrested in 2005. Father Guyo Marley was 48 years in 2005, Mohamed Bagajo 29 years, Aiden Mohamed 41 years, Roba Bariche 30 years, and Mahati Halake 17 years old. They had now come to the realization that one of these guys had been a minor at the time of the offense. The age of majority in Kenya is 18 years, and Mahati Halake was 17 years at the time. This fact had not been brought out during the first hearing. I wonder how that had slid past them. Halake was indeed a minor in 2005 and the Children's Act should have been considered. In conclusion, during the resentencing, the judge reduced Halake's sentence to the period already served. In short, he was released and deemed to have served his sentence. As for the rest of the group, the judge said, I have considered the applicant's age the period they have been in prison from the date of arrest, and the report on their level of rehabilitation. Having done all that, I hereby substitute the life sentences each of the applicants is serving with a sentence of 27 years. In short, the judge ordered them to each serve 27 years from the date they were first arraigned in court. That is, 2005 adds 27 years. They should be up for release in 2032. Father Guyo Male will be in his late 70s when he's up for release and the rest will not be very far off behind. The trial and subsequent sentencing of Father Guyo Wako and his group brought a sense of justice, but it also left a profound sense of sorrow. 
the revelation that a fellow priest had betrayed Bishop Luigi Locati in such a horrific way only added to the tragedy. This man, who had dedicated over 40 years of his life to serving the people of Isiolo, fell victim to a sinister plot orchestrated by those close to him. His life was taken in a senseless act of violence, fueled by greed. Sadly, he died just a mere nine days to his 77th birthday. After his death, a requiem mass for Bishop Luigi Locati was held at St. Eusebius Cathedral, where even the then president of Kenya, Mwai Kibaki, was in attendance. Afterwards, Bishop Locati was buried in the crypt, which is an underground chamber within the basement of the cathedral. The memory of Bishop Locati will never be forgotten. Today, the institutions he built continue to serve the people of Isiolo, which is a testament to the fact that his legacy still lives on. May his soul rest in peace. That brings us to the end of today's episode, guys. I would really like to hear your thoughts down below. And as usual, do not forget to subscribe, to like, and to share this episode with other true crime junkies like yourself. See you here on the next one. Bye-bye.